2020 Daily Trail markers, former Congressman Beto O'Rourke ended his presidential campaign Friday. The Texas Democrat announced the decision on Twitter. He thanked his supporters, adding, quote, let us continue to fearlessly champion the issues and causes that brought us together. The news broke just hours before O'Rourke was expected at a Hallmark dinner in Iowa. We're now just three months away from that state's caucuses, and Ed O'Keefe is there. He had said he was born to be in it, but today, Beto O'Rourke bowed out in a statement saying, it is clear to me now that this campaign does not have the means to move forward successfully. He spent most of the later months of his campaign pushing for mandatory buybacks of military-style assault weapons in the wake of a mass shooting in his hometown of El Paso, Texas. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. We're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. But he failed to gain traction, polling at just 1% in a new Iowa poll. The news comes as the poll's frontrunner, Elizabeth Warren, after months of being asked, finally answered how she'd pay for her government-run health care plan. We can have Medicare for all without raising taxes one cent on middle-class families. Instead, her plan would divert the funds employers currently pay private health care companies to the government and increase taxes on the wealthy with assets above a billion dollars. It's all fully paid for by asking the top 1% and giant corporations to pay a fair share. Former Vice President Joe Biden calls the plan mathematical gymnastics. There's no way, even Bernie, who talks about the need to raise middle class taxes, he can't even meet the cost of it. Bernie Sanders would raise taxes on the middle class, but he says that would be offset by the drops in co-pays and premiums. So let's bring in now Ed O'Keefe and Caitlin Huey Burns. Hi, guys. Ed, I want to first ask you about former Congressman Beto O'Rourke ending his presidential campaign Friday. He had earlier tried to reboot his campaign, as you outlined in your package there, after that tragic shooting in his hometown of El Paso. So what do we know about the circumstances the specific circumstances of his departure from the race. I mean, it's our understanding that it even caught some of his underlings by surprise. Uh, he, he not only caught his opponents by surprise, he caught his staff by surprise. He caught his own volunteers here on the streets of Des Moines, Iowa by surprise. They were out this morning around 5 a.m. putting up a lot of the lawn signs that surround this arena right now. In fact, if we look over here, um, this is essentially what's left of the Beto O'Rourke presidential campaign. Uh, literally just hours before this event is set to begin, announcing uh, on social media that he was going to be dropping out. He held a rally just a block down the street with supporters before he showed up. Some of them were seen hugging each other, uh, crying at the news. When we approached to try to document them as they pulled lawn signs out of the ground, uh, campaign staff approached and asked us to please be sensitive because it was a tricky time for those volunteers and staffers. But look, that's raw politics. Yeah. Bottom line, O'Rourke didn't have it. And, uh, and we're down to about, what are we at now, 18 candidates yeah, in the race? just 18. So, Caitlin, yeah. how then do you think O'Rourke's exit will impact the Democratic primary field? Where do you think his supporters are likely to land? Well, at least here in Iowa, I think one of the contributions to him having to get out of the race was that he wasn't really gaining much support at all. A new poll came out today that showed him at just 1%. And so uh, if he has any supporters left, I think you have to kind of wonder where they go because you wonder kind of where Beto, Cam Beto O'Rourke's campaign was going. Uh, he really campaigned aggressively to the left in the ending days of his campaign. But I will say that, you know, we have to watch what kind of impact this is going to have on the rest of the candidates in the field, given that we're just 94 days away from people starting to actually uh, participate in the caucus here in Iowa. You're seeing campaigns reassess where they are. Kamala Harris today uh, made news by saying that she's cutting uh, her uh, field staff from New Hampshire. Uh, and we know earlier this week she said she's going all in in Iowa. So this is a time the campaigns are kind of getting into crunch time, figuring out if they have the money to keep going. Uh, the debates have also played a huge factor in this race. Beto O'Rourke was not yet, uh, did not yet have the qualifications to make that next debate in November. And as we know, a lot of the candidates who aren't able to make that stage, it's really difficult to break through. And the added challenge that we've seen for these candidates is the overarching story of the impeachment inquiry. We're seeing that it's very hard to get your message out there, to get it on the news uh, every day while the impeachment inquiry is going 
going on. Uh, so that made an extra challenge for candidates like Better Work and others who are kind of lower down in the polls. So, you know, Ed, we just heard Caitlin mention that Kamala Harris is cutting her entire field staff in New Hampshire. Uh, what do you make of that staffing choice? Is she just cutting her losses in the places where she's not resonating? Pretty much. Look, this is what happens this time of uh, this time in a cycle that you, you hit November with only about three months to go until the caucus. And you've got to have your Iowa strategy in place. And Kamala Harris's Iowa strategy is to place third or better. If that's the strategy, she has a lot of work to do because that poll out today from The New York Times and Siena Research puts her far back in the pack. And her campaign has made very clear, third or better in Iowa, or the justification to continue is tricky. So she's bringing in people from California, from Nevada, from New Hampshire, downsizing her national campaign in Baltimore as well, and, and trying to make some kind of inroads here. Right. The event that's being held tonight in this arena, Tanya, uh, can be a real inflection point in this entire campaign. It was at this event 12 years ago that a young Senator Barack Obama showed up and just blew the roof off the place with his speech impressing people, and from there he went on to win the caucus and eventually the nomination. The hope for a lot of these campaigns tonight, including Harris, who frankly on the stump does really well, can resonate with the crowd, is that they somehow catch fire tonight and can, can build on that momentum and take it into those next 94 days. <laughs> the ghost days. of Barack Obama there in the room. So meanwhile, Ed, as we heard in your piece, Warren has dodged questions for months about how she intends to pay for Medicare for all. So did her proposal Friday go far enough to satisfy both the questions and the critics? Uh, not the critics, for sure. We'll see about the questions. It's really only still a few hours old. And essentially now lays out a plan that she says would keep middle class taxes from going up, would lead to increased taxes for people with essentially more than a billion dollars in assets. But she also makes a lot of other presumptions. One, that there's total democratic control of Washington. Two, that things like comprehensive immigration reform are enacted, which, let's be honest, Washington has struggled to do anything quite like that over the last several years. And three, that somehow her program would dramatically bring down overall cost of health care spending in this country. So it was dismissed today as uh, phony math by not only Democrats, but a handful of Republicans, perhaps not surprisingly. And you better believe in the coming days it'll be fodder for all of her opponents who question her math and her motives. Right. And Caitlin, Senator Bernie Sanders, of course, is also considered a champion of Medicare for all. Has he received the same type of scrutiny over his plan to pay and implement his plan that Senator Warren has? You know, the big difference between the way that Bernie Sanders has asked, answered the question about whether this plan would raise taxes on the middle class and Elizabeth Warren not answering the question, which led to her having to release a plan, is that Bernie Sanders, every time he's been asked about it, has said, yes, middle class taxes will go up. But guess what? The money that you pay for your premiums will go down. And he has this this line that's kind of uh, he's been repeating on the campaign trail, which is that, you know, I don't know anybody that that likes to pay higher premiums. Uh, so that's kind of why he's been able to avoid the kind of criticism for the question about how he would pay for it. He was also the architect of the Medicare for All bill uh, and has actually in the last debate, he and Warren have not gone after each other, but he did say that you need to be able to explain how you will pay for it. So that's why he's been able to kind of get through this. But these questions will remain, especially as we're seeing uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren uh, at the top tier. These other candidates like Pete Buttigieg will be here uh, this weekend as well, trying to make the argument against that and against those policies. And that's kind of the heart of the Democratic debate right now. Right. And you can hear behind us, there's a, uh, there's a drum line uh, <laughs> for uh, Amy Klobuchar. This event is kind of a big pep rally and a real test of of organization for a lot of these candidates. Well, the it's, a testament to you, it's a testament to you guys. We can still hear you despite the, the drumming in the background. But, Ed, you know, when can we expect to see Warren and Sanders finally going at it? Because a new poll finds Warren leading the field in Iowa. She's followed, of course, by Sanders, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and former Vice President Joe Biden. So, first of all, when are we going to see the Sanders, you know, Warren showdown? And what can we attribute to? Uh, this, you know, Biden's fourth place standing in Iowa. Well, look, uh, you talk to people who've been here since the summer, since before then, since this time last year, and they've said Warren is on top of things in Iowa. She's building an impressive team, a large team, one that reaches out to her supporters and potential voters frequently. 
Uh, the, the demonstration of that operation is expected tonight inside here when thousands of her supporters are expected to turn out, and they've been on the streets uh, today as well, sort of, you know, showing force. Uh, as for a potential fight with Sanders, we'll see, but now there is some contrast because she would pay for Medicare for All differently than he does. He would implement it in four years. Today she hinted that she would implement it in five years. So those are potential areas of disagreement that could potentially spark some kind of a fight, but really that's also kind of an argument around the margins. They both ultimately want the same thing. There are other people in their party who don't want it at all. That seems to be the larger disagreement that is likely to continue. As for Joe Biden's fourth place finish, look, again, you talk to people here and they say he's not showing up, his operation isn't nearly as big, and it signals that there are Democrats in this state, at least, who are looking for somebody else. All right, so, Caitlin, could that somebody else be Mayor Pete Buttigieg? I mean, we know he's conducting a bus tour across the state this weekend, and you're going to be there with him for a few of the stops. How is he trying to differentiate himself from the rest of the field is he trying to move into that moderate lane that Joe Biden may be losing? Yeah, I think it's a good indication of how these candidates may be sensing some weaknesses in Joe Biden's uh, support by trying to find a room in, in the more moderate lane of the party. And I think that's a pretty much kind of a strategy shift for Pete Buttigieg, uh, who has been trying to occupy that. And we've seen that he's been able to raise a lot of money, which really matters in a place like Iowa. Uh, this is his second bus tour in this state. So he's going to be all over Iowa over the weekend through Monday. Uh, and he has seen a surge in his poll numbers, especially here in Iowa. And there is this sense that some of these candidates, you can say also Amy Klobuchar, who's been spending a lot of time here, I think has the second most stops uh, in this state of all the candidates, uh, trying to make that appeal to the more moderate members of the party and those who were maybe inclined to support Joe Biden and have kind of watched how his campaign has gone. Uh, and someone like Pete Buttigieg, of course, is arguing for that generational contrast, that generational shift, uh, something that he's been talking about since the beginning of his campaign. All right. Well, Ed O'Keefe and Caitlin Huey Burns, thanks so much to you both.